Hey, it's Ryan Reynolds, and I'm here with Keith, co-star of my upcoming film, If, only in theaters May 17th. Do you want to tell people the big news? All right, I'll do it. Sign up now and you'll get unlimited for $15 a month in six months of Paramount Plus Essential Plan on us. Mintmobile.com slash switch. Upfront payment of $45 equivalent to $15 per month. Unlimited over 40 gigabytes per month. Face lower speeds. Videos at 480p. Active Mint customers by 531.24 get six months of Paramount Plus Essential Plan. Auto renews after six months. Offer ends May 31st, 2024. Separate Paramount Plus registration required. Terms and conditions apply if rated PG. You are listening to Women's Running Stories, the podcast where exceptional women runners share inspirational stories about their running experiences. Hello and welcome. My name is Cherie Louise Turner. I am the host and producer of this podcast. And I am also a runner. And this episode is part five of the Over 50 Sub 20 5K project, where I am tracking my journey to break 20 minutes in the 5K in my 50s. I have been a runner for many, many years, and for most of that time, I have focused on the marathon and ultra distances. But last year, in 2023, I changed that up and I decided to focus on the 5K. I have never broken 20 minutes in the 5K distance, and I am currently 54 years old. If you haven't listened to the previous episodes in the series, parts one through four, you may want to go back and give those a listen because they'll give you a lot more context on the journey so far. But this is not a prerequisite. I will catch you up on where things are at and give you some broad strokes about the journey in general. So yeah, let's just get to it. So coming into last year, 2023, I had on the books already to run the Boston Marathon in April and then to run the 56 Mile Comrades Marathon in June. I did both of those things and then I started focusing on the 5K. And on August 30th of last year, I set what I'm calling my baseline time and that was 21 minutes and 10 seconds. And I consider that the starting point of this journey. Coming into the end of last year, I did experience a non-running injury that took me out of training for a couple of months. Coming into the new year, I got back to training, and I left you off in the last episode at the end of March setting a new personal best parkrun time. If you are not familiar with parkrun, these are free weekly timed 5K runs. They happen every single Saturday. Parkruns happen in many places all over the world. And I have been a dedicated park runner for many, many years. To date, I have completed 176 park runs, so it's been a while. At some park runs, I give a really big effort, and at other park runs, I take it very easy. And of course, the courses from one park run to another are different, so times I've clocked at park runs vary a lot. But suffice to say, I have on many occasions shown up to a flat, fast park run and given my all, and right before the recording of the last episode for this series, I set a new parkrun PR, and that was 21.51. And my previous fastest parkrun time had been 22.05. But during that parkrun, my watch completely malfunctioned. I did not realize this in the moment. I felt like I was going good, which I actually was, but the pace on the watch did not reflect that accurately, so it caused all sorts of confusion. I thought, gosh, I am working so hard here, and look, I'm really not running that fast. And so it caused confusion and frustration and worry, and there were just all these thoughts churning around in my head about what could possibly be going wrong with my body that I'm working this hard and only going this fast. So I spent a lot of my energy worrying about that and focusing on these numbers, which of course resulted in me being completely detached from what my body was actually doing and not focusing on the task at hand, which was simply to run. Believe me, when I got this all sorted out in the end, I felt pretty silly. And yeah, it wasn't until later when I got the follow-up email from Parkrun with my results that I realized I had run this Parkrun PR. And the whole episode really highlighted the fact that I need to stop relying so heavily on my watch, I need to stop being distracted by these numbers, and I need to learn to run by feel. This is something I have known for a while and a skill that I have wanted to become good at because I know it will improve my running. And every time I think about this issue of being too reliant on the watch and how it removes me from being in tune with my body, 
I think about something form running expert Jay Grunke of The Balanced Runner said to me back in a 2021 interview that I did with her. So I'm just going to play you this bit of tape from the interview. And this is Jay talking about this issue of relying on watches and technology. Then there's there's also this, you know, and, and I'll be honest, this really frightens me, that we are losing any notion of our our true capabilities as human beings as um, technology comes more and more into our lives. And like in, in the large sense, technology has been coming into our lives since our first ancient ancestors, you know, used a stick to dig a root. <laughs> and, and, you know, and there's, so let me step back and say, you know, the technology I know is in a certain sense made us who we are, but that's not, well, and it will continue to make us whoever will become, but it will be with a, a fraction of the abilities that are our birthright as human beings. So most and and the the more that the technology comes in and it comes in so early in a person's pro- process of being becoming a runner that they never learn to gauge their own body you know our ancestors wouldn't have survived if they didn't have this ability in in in, in incredibly rich and resonant detail and it is absolutely available to us but i think more and more um tech companies that have so much to gain from persuading of this make us feel like our only path forward to be co- to exceed the limitations that we experience and even to interact with our own bodies and to perform physically is mediated by technology and um it is a terrible theft and so um every runner should be able to and happy to leave their watch at home Yeah. The horror. Yeah. The horror. (laughs) So I do not leave my watch at home, but I have been spending far less time looking at it when I run. And it is really nice. I have come to realize what a brain drain it can be to regularly keep looking at the data on your arm. And I really do enjoy when I'm just focusing on running especially during big efforts like intervals or tempo runs. And one great tool I have started implementing, I thank my husband for alerting me to this feature on my Garmin watch, and that is pre-programmed workouts. I don't have to think about how much time has elapsed. I don't have to check how far I've run. Did I reach the end of my interval yet? I don't have to check any of that, and it is really freeing. So I have been implementing these pre-programmed workouts into my watch ever since, and I love it. This is one way that the watch can be a very helpful tool. But on the other hand, a watch can serve as a big distraction. So I've been working on not watching my watch so much, and another area that I pinpointed last episode that I need work on is pacing. This is still totally a work in progress, and that will become evident later in the episode, Because, yeah, I do not have this dialed in yet. So that is where I left you off in the last episode. That episode was at the end of March. It is now the end of May. So it's been about two months, and that is what I'm going to cover in this episode. And very broadly speaking, I'm doing great. At the end of March and through the first parts of April, I did go through some periods of big fatigue and then feeling good. It was several weeks of feeling just really kind of chaotic and like my energy was sort of randomly all over the place. I had terrific workouts and then I had some days where I just felt so tired and there wasn't always a whole lot of clear rhyme or reason as to why I felt one way one day and another way the next day. And that brings me to one point that I do want to highlight, and that is the fact that I am coming out of the end of perimenopause. And so I do still find myself going through these times of feeling chaotic. That fatigue I was feeling was also coupled with a lot of anxiety. That was just really strong and really uncomfortable. It was just not fun. 
But I've been able to weather those periods of time much better than in the past because I know that they are passing. I'm definitely feeling more periods of being steady and then I'll go through these chaotic times and then back to things feeling steady again. And by steady, I mean like my body responds in a predictable way. I do a hard effort and then I feel tired the next day. I rest and then I feel recovered. Like inputs and outputs align in ways that make sense to me. I also feel like my recovery is improving, which is really nice. So overall, especially over about the past month, I feel like I am recovering well, I am training really strong, my body feels good, and I feel like I'm moving well. So things are good. And like I mentioned, even in those kind of chaotic times at the end of March and beginning of April, I did have some terrific days of running, and one of those came at the park run that happened the very next weekend after the park run PR where I had the watch malfunction. I knew I was running really well and I wanted to go after another park run PR, but this time I wasn't going to watch the watch. In fact, my coach had emailed me and said, put tape over your watch, <laughs> which I did not do, but I did vow to not look at it. But I also did want to work on some more even pacing. So to help me out with that, my husband offered to pace me, which was terrific. He is a great pacer. And I set another new PR. I ran a 21.47, so I knocked yet a few more seconds off my parkrun PR. The other thing that cropped up in that particular effort was that there was this moment, I want to say it was about in the last mile or so, and we were starting to slow a little bit, and my husband said, You know, you can get this PR, but we have to go now. So just let me know what you want to do. And I didn't hesitate. I made a little surge because there was no talking at this point. But I made this little surge to let him know, yeah, let's go for it. And I did. And it was really satisfying because it reminded me that I do have that instinct of just doubling down and really going for it. And that is something I've been working a lot on, and that is really staying in the effort toward the end of the 5K because it's hard. But yeah, I got another PR. This effort did bring up one other thing, though. I'm also going to return to this toward the end of the episode, and that is that I realize that I need to be careful about how often I do these sorts of things where I just really give my all and go to the well Because it's exhausting to get up that sort of emotional energy and to give like that 110%. And I'm realizing I can't do that too often without experiencing some burnout. So yeah, I'm going to return to that point. But in the moment, this PR, it was very satisfying. It was also one of the first times that I have been able to show up to an effort with expectation and not be totally riddled with performance anxiety. And this is a big shift for me. The park run the previous week where I'd set the PR, but my watch had been wonky, I had zero expectations. Like I mentioned, I didn't even realize that I'd run that well until long after the fact. I had just wanted to run hard on that day. But coming into the park run the next weekend, I 100% was looking to set a PR. And in the past, that has been an issue for me. Expectations cause a lot of performance or race anxiety, but this time was different. And I wrote to my coach about it afterwards. And what I wrote to her was, I've noticed that I've been good at seizing the moment when it just appears and I don't expect it. But when I do have expectations, that's when I get in my head and things really start to go sideways. So being able to expect that I can do well and actually be calm and determined about that is cool. And it was cool. And she followed up with lots of wisdom. And there was one phrase in particular that really hit me. And it was this. Calmness is power. Expectation is a distraction. So while I did have expectations on that park run day, in the moment I was able to remain calm and focus on the task at hand. And part of the reason for that is I had been starting to address this issue of race anxiety and learning how to calm myself. So yeah, calmness and this idea of calmness as power versus distraction, this has become a big focus for me. 
removing distraction and finding calm. To me, they're very intertwined. I see calmness as a power because there's no wasted energy on anything. You can be totally in the task at hand. It allows your body and your mind to operate smoothly and efficiently. Distractions, on the other hand, sap my energy and can cause tension, so they have the opposite effect. And I see distractions coming in many forms. Expectation is one of them, and also watching the watch. That's another big one for me. So the key is finding calm, which to me is very tied to being in the moment. And like I said, I had been working on this even before the park run. I mean, this is something I have returned to a lot in my life. But more recently, I've been giving it extra attention because I really want to get a handle on this anxiety. And as I've been focusing more on this, one of the things I've noticed is that I put the intention of something I'd like to improve, like finding calm and reducing anxiety, out into the world, and I begin to notice that the answers and the advice that help me with those issues start to show up. And of course, part of me is like, oh, yay, the universe is bringing me all of these answers, which, you know, I do have some belief in that. But I also feel like I'm just paying more attention to when those topics arise and I'm ready to absorb that advice and do something with it. And one big contributor recently to helping me along this path is Katie Arnold's new book, Brief Flashings in the Phenomenal World. I love this book. Katie Arnold is an ultra runner. I got to interview her for the podcast. I will link to her episode in the show notes. It is amazing. She has an incredible story which she captures in her book. And in short, it's about her experiencing a really awful whitewater rafting accident and then her return to running and having an incredible race at the Leadville 100. This was several years ago. And a big part of Katie's working through this injury, her return to running, and having this great performance is that she practices Zen meditation, which is something that is close to my heart. I studied Buddhism when I was in college. It's a philosophy I have studied and gotten a lot out of over the years. And so as she was talking about her experiences, I thought, I'm going to give meditation a try once again. I have meditated many times in my life, and I have tried to make it a regular practice, and it has just never clicked for me. I generally find that I'm someone, when I sit down to meditate, I inevitably am just really looking forward to when it's going to be done. But I decided to give it a go once again, and I found that this time I am getting more out of it. I think a big part of it is I'm just ready to be able to meditate. I don't do it all the time, I'm getting back into a practice, but I have been meditating more regularly and I do find that it is making a difference. I've also been doing a lot of visualization and I've been studying about gaining confidence, which I have found as I learn to be more confident, it makes me more calm. This reduces my anxiety, which then also makes it easier to meditate. So yeah, these things start to all feel totally intertwined anxiety, insecurity, lack of confidence. So as I address one issue, I notice shifts in other issues. But of course, this is a process, and it is not at all linear. Sometimes I do lapse into old bad habits. And like I mentioned earlier, at the end of March and beginning of April, I did go through a period where I felt really wonky. I had that fatigue And my anxiety kicked up, and it really manifested around my trip to Boston. I went to Boston over Marathon Weekend. I had the great privilege of getting to co-host a panel at the Boston Marathon Expo, and it was terrific fun. I've done it before. I love co-hosting these panels, but there was a lot going on that weekend, and I always get a bit nervous before doing a live event. Anyway, with all the travel, all that was going on over Marathon Weekend, it kicked up this anxiety. And that came to a head at the park run, of all things. I was returning to a park run that I love, the Jamaica Pond Park Run. I was really excited. It's always a great event before the marathon. Loads of people show up to use it as a shakeout run. But I just had this huge anxiety reaction, and my breath got totally out of control. And, you know, I just I really wanted to run a fast park run that day, and it completely fell apart. And I just thought, ah, I really have to get a handle on whatever this anxiety situation is because, yeah, I'd been addressing this, but clearly there was more work to be done. 
And I knew I had a 5K race coming up once I returned home to Ireland right on the heels of this Boston trip. And even the thought of lining up again, I could feel the stress rising. So I doubled down on addressing it and made a real effort to show up to this next start line back in that calm, focused mindset. So getting ready for that 5K, I did a lot of meditation before that race. I did a lot of visualization, and I focused a lot on having confidence at the line. And it worked. I showed up to that race feeling calm and prepared, and I felt confident. I felt confident in a way that I haven't in a really long time. And it was this feeling I remember having when I was a bike racer way back when, when I was in my early 20s. It was my full-time pursuit. I was on a domestic pro team, and I was really fit. I could race really well. I was fast. I had a tremendous amount of confidence in what my body was capable of and in my ability to perform in my sport. And there was a little bit of that feeling coming back where I would just, I feel strong and confident and capable. And it was great. And I just thought, this is the feeling I want to return to. Just feeling really able in my body and able to show up to the line and give what I had on the day. And I had a really good run. It wasn't going to be a PR run. I knew that going in. That also certainly helped reduce race anxiety. I knew I could just kind of show up and give my best effort. It was an out and back course and it was a rolling downhill on the way out and a rolling uphill coming back. So we worked on pacing well, giving my all, all the way to the end, and I did exactly that. And I felt so satisfied and I had so much fun and I ran strong. It was, I will say, a total success. There is also the matter of getting faster and going after this time goal. And I've done a little bit of reframing around this goal because yes, I wanna break 20 minutes in the 5K, but first I need to break 21 minutes and I haven't done that yet. And the reason I bring up this reframing of first meeting the sub 21 minute goal is that I do find that I have this tendency to get ahead of myself, to feel like I should be further along than I am or that I should be able to run a certain pace that I'm not quite able to run yet. And this was something that journalist and marathon runner Amelia Benton brought up in a recent interview I had with her. So Amelia had brought up that in her many years journey of going after a Boston qualifier, she had indeed let expectations get the better of her on several occasions. And it really hit home because it speaks directly to this. And I thought, ah, that's me too. And here's what she said. And being pretty familiar with the Boston Marathon goal that many people have, I immediately set my sights on that. Um, I knew I wanted to run a qualifier eventually. And I think I got a little ahead of myself. Like after that, I had a few marathons that didn't quite go so well, even though I might have been a little more prepared and more knowledgeable about how to train for them and how to execute races, I feel like I still had a lot to learn. I think I would say, I mean, I've run 13 marathons to date and most of them have gone badly. And I think for most of them, I did kind of get ahead of myself and tried to go after goals that I wasn't necessarily physically or mentally prepared to tackle just yet. Yeah, going after goals I am not physically or mentally prepared to tackle just yet. Yeah, it resonates. Because in my case, of course, I'm looking at this sub 20 minute goal and recognizing I am not there yet. I shouldn't even be thinking about that particular goal today. And I have noticed a number of repercussions about looking too far down the line and having expectations or frustrations that I should be able to run faster than I actually can right now. It sets me up for bad pacing. I think I should be able to run a faster 5K, so I'm setting off at a pace that I can't hold. It makes me disappointed in performances that are actually good and important stepping stones in this process. And it can tend to leave me just generally feeling dissatisfied or frustrated. And I've also noticed it's starting to cause a little bit of burnout because this is tough. And I recognize I've got a ways to go. So I'm returning to that old lesson that comes back again and again and again. And that is to reach a big goal, it is really important to have small steps in between 
and to celebrate each one. I'm also seeing that it's really important to see how wins can come from places other than hitting certain times. Overcoming anxiety, that's a win. Learning how to have confidence in myself, that's a win. And all down the line. And especially because these wins spill into my life. I'm not just addressing anxiety that happens in running and racing. This also has an impact on the general anxiety that I feel at other times. And I'm not just addressing confidence in my athletic performances. I use those same tools in other areas. So these are important wins too. But I also have these time goals. So my first, not even really small step in between is to break 21 minutes. And I feel very excited about this goal because I know this is something within my grasp now. That being said, I do not have a big exciting announcement to say, ta-da, in my last race, I did that. I did line up just a few days ago with my sights very specifically set on breaking this 21 minutes, and I really felt like this was something I could do. It was a flat 5K. The weather was good. I warmed up really well. I had fueled properly, and I was ready to go. I also had a couple of other thoughts on the line, and one was I wasn't going to look at my watch and I was really going to try and pace myself, I can already tell you this didn't happen. The other thing was that there was another woman lining up. I've raced against her before. She's a bit faster than I am, and I thought, I'm going to try and stay with her. So I did, and I felt great until about halfway through, and then things got really tough. I had some moments of questioning. I had some frustrations. I did stick with the effort, and I dug deep, and I even managed an extra kick coming in to the last 100 meters or so. But I will admit to being a bit disappointed when the clock showed 21.20. When I did go back and look at my splits, however, I ran an opening mile of 6.38, which was too fast. My pacing is still not awesome, and I will be working on that. I do know I gave my all on the day. I was probably a little tired because I've been doing a lot of hard training recently. So in the end, I'm not discouraged. I know I will break through the 21-minute barrier very soon. Because I also know that there's one other ingredient that was a little bit missing in this last race. And that was just sort of that extra spark or fire or excitement that comes when you are truly just excited to go all in. I mentioned up top that I've started being more mindful of sort of giving my all, 110%, going to the well too often because it can lead to some burnout. And I feel like I'm starting to see a little of that. It's not bad. I really love to race, and that hasn't diminished. But I've been lining up a lot between park runs and other races, which are more than I've mentioned here. And I do tend to want to give my all maybe a little too often. And emotionally, it can be pretty draining. So I need to manage this a little bit better and make sure I replenish that energy before I give it my all once again. So that is where I am at. I am feeling strong. I'm putting in great training and I'm healthy. And I do make a point of always returning to being super thankful that I can do this at all. My body feels terrific. Whatever the times on the clock might be, I am thrilled that I am strong and I move well at 54 years old and that I even have a chance to reach this goal. It is incredible, and I don't ever take that for granted. And one thing I want to add here is that I've been poking around on the Reddit threads, and there have been some good comments I found about going after 5K PRs, and there were two things that really cropped up. One was people talking about how they plateaued for a while, and then they'd have this breakthrough race. So I'm kind of waiting for that day to come. And the other thing that people mentioned is that once they had broken through a certain time barrier, they found it much easier to break through that time barrier the next time. So I'm also very hopeful about that. And I'm giving myself about a three-week break before I go after another flat, fast 5K. I feel like that's a good amount of time to build back this fire, this spark, this energy, to really, really give it my all, and I'm going to focus on better pacing. I really need to nail that piece of this puzzle because I know it's going to make a big difference. And that does bring me to the end 
of part five of the Over 50 Sub 20 5K project. I will return in another couple months to give you an update on my progress. In the meantime, there is now a dedicated Instagram account for this project. It is the over five zero sub two zero underscore five K underscore project. Of course, I will link to that in the show notes. I'm also going to link to a couple of books about building confidence that I have found helpful. And I will link to the three episodes that I mentioned, the one that features Jay Grunke, the one that features Amelia Benton, and also Katie Arnold's episode. Thank you so much for coming on this journey with me. It really is a joy, and I'm really having fun, even with the challenges and the ups and the downs and whatever frustrations I may be experiencing. This journey is far more fulfilling than I ever expected it to be. And it's also about so much more than time on a clock. I'm amazed. So thank you for joining me. I always appreciate you being here. And until next week, I am Cherie Louise Turner. I'm the host and producer of Women's Running Stories. And I wish you healthy, joyful strides forward. Women's Running Running. Running running stories. stories. My name is Cindy Burnett, and each week I interview at least two traditionally published authors on my podcast, Thoughts from a Page. We talk spoiler free about their books, so you can listen whether you have read the book or not. And then we delve into things that you most likely won't hear about anywhere else the importance of the cover design, why they included various aspects of the story personal details about both the books and the author's lives, and so much more. You can find the podcast on every major platform and learn more about it on my website, thoughtsfromapage.com. Thanks so much for checking it out.